So um, I'm Teresa Wilhelmson. I'm the Assistant State Engineer for the Appropriations Section, or um, now called the Applications and Records Section. You heard from two of our folks, um, Clark and Chris today, and then Tamara will be presenting after lunch. Um, but to, what I'm gonna cover is the approval criteria and hearings. Um, but I'm gonna start with some application approval criteria. Several people have mentioned it's a black box, and I'm gonna show you um, in statute how or what the criteria is that we use to evaluate applications. Um, I'm also going to talk just a little bit in detail about quantity impairment. It's a new um, element or criterion statute since 2015 that um, we've been dealing with and we've sent several notices of that. So we'll talk just a little bit about what that is. And then I'm going to give just a brief summary on hearings. Um, Clark covered that um, as well, but I'll give just a little bit more brief on that. And then as far as approval criteria as well, um, sometimes people forget that um, we do have d d division site specific policies. And so not only the statutory criteria, but we also have to use site specific policies to evaluate these decisions. So we'll t I'll talk briefly about that. And then um, conditional approvals, um, just what that means, uh, many of you I'm seeing some familiar faces here, get this approval, and there may be some conditions to that approval that you really need to pay attention to. Because um, we were able to approve the application because of certain conditions that we outlined in that application. So, um, wrong way. So to get started, um, I wanted to read this quote, which I really like. And it's actually from a, a well-known um, water attorney. And he did this in a presentation probably over 30 years ago. But it's, he said, um, when there's enough water of good quality available at the right place, almost any system of water law will work. Um, when there is not enough water, no system of water law can provide water to make up that deficiency. Only nature can do that. However, water law can optimize the use of the water that nature makes available. And I think for any of us that um, work in water rights or water law, um, that water law can't make up the physical water. Only nature can do that. So when we talk about these applications that have been discussed earlier today, it really is the law that's been established to help us make those determinations so that the water that is available and it is um, for people to use, there is a order and certainty to that. So um, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here, but applications, um, there are various different applications. Clark covered quite a few of those um, that we have. We have an application to appropriate, um, Typically, our office handles about 500 of those a year um, around the state. Um, we have change applications, which you would file most likely in an area that is close to new appropriations, um, but you may acquire yourselves without our involvement a water right that maybe you purchased to file a change to do the use that you're hoping to do. Um, change applications, we do about a thousand a year on change applications throughout the state. Um, temporary applications, Clark covered that. Um, there are one time, one year appropriation. Fixed time applications are usually for a fixed time. There's usually an essential, essential purpose to that project which maybe is gonna take about 10 years to complete that. Maybe it's like a remediation or a cleanup or oil drilling or you know something like that. And then we also have exchange applications um, that are filed. The majority of those exchanges, like Chris mentioned, are filed in, based on contracts with Weber Basin. And we do about 100 of those um, exchange applications, applications a year. So this is the flow chart that a couple different people have used. Um, and where I'm gonna focus in this presentation really is that first part of this um, process. When an application is filed, 
what do we have to do or what do we do um, on those applications to get those um, through the process. And I'm not going to cover what Clark, and I'm not sure on Tamara's, but Clark, as far as advertising, protest period, that type of thing, I'm really just going to focus on um, the, the criteria that we evaluate, statutory criteria that we evaluate when we look at an application that's been filed. So um, the approval criteria. So what is the approval criteria that we use? Um, it is um, provided by Utah Code. And particularly, it's section 73-3-8, which covers the approval or rejection of an application, and 73-3-3, which talks about permanent and temporary changes to water. And those are the primary two that we will look at. There's a whole slew of them um, that we also consider, but those pertain directly. Um, so this first part of the presentation that I'm going to look at is we're just going to piece down um, each of those statutory criteria that we look at. Um, so the first standard, um, or first, what we, it's the standard of proof or the burden on the applicant through an application process. Um, when somebody submits an application, it is the applicant's application. It's not our application, it's their application. And um, the, the standard of um, review or the standard of proof that that applicant needs to overcome is what's called um, a reason to believe that the application can be made. Um, Clark mentioned um, preponderance of the evidence on diligence claims. That's a little bit higher standard. So um, just to kind of give you an idea, um, a low-end um, legal standard would be um, reasonable suspicion that something occurred. That high end is beyond a reasonable doubt. Right in the middle is the preponderance of the evidence, and just lower than that is reason to believe. So an applicant has the responsibility to give reason to believe that this application they're giving us can be approved um, in accordance with this statutory um, review that we will do. So. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about protestants and their responsibilities to it. Um, essentially, so Utah Code 7338, I mentioned that to you in the beginning, but the first criteria, um, it says that it shall be the d duty of the state engineer to approve an application if there is a reason to believe. Um, and for applications to appropriate, that there is unappropriated water in the source. So we're talking applications to appropriate for this particular one. Um, like I mentioned, there are about 500 applications to appropriate that are filed um, or were filed last year in um, statewide. Most of those are the eastern um, side of the state, some west desert areas um, for the Weber office. Um, but it is, so the criteria we would look at is, is there an appropriated water in that source? Um, there is an example of a case here. Um, so various basins in the, that are in the state are closed to new appropriations. Um, the water has been applied for and is being fully used, any of the, the available resource that's there. Um, there are some areas that um, the water may be um, fully allocated, but it hasn't been put to full use as of yet. And so there are some circumstances where we will still allow applications to appropriate because we look for those applications to get developed and in place to fully utilize the resource that's there. Um, and this is just a case where um, that had been determined um, on our website, with this unappropriated water in the proposed source, this is a map that shows the areas that are open or closed or restricted to applications to appropriate. I'm assuming Jim will kind of show this a little bit more. Um, but essentially, as I mentioned, in areas that are closed and no appropriations can be made, um, someone needs to acquire an existing right and file a change application on that existing right um, to propose to do the project um, that they want to do. And I would encourage you, I'm not sure 
all the areas of the state that you guys are from. Um, but go to our website, look at the areas where you're working, and go to these policy pages to understand um, what is the appropriation policy for the area where you're working, and it will help you understand that. So um, this next one is the second criteria, and um, this is a classic photo, actually, that you'll see around um, various places. I actually even have it hanging in my office. But um, I think that I'm going to adopt a new criteria. The first criteria is you have to get the little black lab out of that situation and safe. Then you can mediate the situation. <laughs> but um, it's actually kind of a classic photo. But the second criteria basically says that this application that you're proposing um, will not impair existing rights or interfere with another use. So um, this is really um, where an applicant, they, if you remember, they have the reason, they have the standard to meet, that it, there's a reason to believe this application can be made. Um, if there's someone who feels that they're going to take their water um, and they want to resort to a shovel fight over a ditch, um, that protestant does have an opportunity to comment and provide their information or enough evidence and fact, not like Clark mentioned that they don't like their neighbor, but if, there's, if they can present enough evidence and fact that would compel a denial of the application. So there is that opportunity um, for someone to um, participate in this process but also help us understand um, if it is going to impair an existing right. Um, and same with protestants, or same with applicants. It's their responsibility to give that reason to believe throughout the entire application process. It is up to the protestants to give us evidence and fact that would compel us to make more of a denial. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to talk about temporary change applications. Um, and then we'll get back into the criteria. But um, temporary change applications as of May 2015, um, there, was no, there is no advertising required, and there's no hearing on a temporary application. Um, I believe temporaries, none, they're not all created equally. And so if you have a project that you're working on in your area and you think um, a temporary change may help you complete that project and you're trying to decide between a permanent change and a temporary, I would suggest you get with the regional engineer or the regional office and talk through that, do a pre-consultation um, with our office and help us determine that. Because even on a temporary, um, we have to look at impairment. Um, it's not just a, a very simple, um, some of them can be, but it's not always just a simple approval on a temporary, even though they're not advertised um, and no hearings held. Now, we could choose to advertise if we felt it was more complicated and we needed public input. But in that case, you really should be filing a permanent change. So just quickly on those temporaries. Um, so on the permanent change applications, um, also, there's two sections of code, which is on this slide that you have, um, 7333-3A. Um, it actually, it talks about that a change um, cannot impair an existing right without just compensation or mitigation. So um, if there is a belief or um, information that a change application may impair someone, that applicant could provide as part of the process information um, or an agreement that would help overcome um, how would they compensate for that right they're going to impair or how could they mitigate for that. Um, but there's this section of code. There's also another section of code. This is the new one I talked about just when I started in 2015 um, that a change also cannot create um, a specific existing right cannot experience quantity impairment um, as a result of a change. And I'm going to go into a, a lot more detail on that particular issue in the next section. So um, exchange applications, I, we had a couple questions on exchanges and the difference. So Utah Code 73320, 
actually covers and is specific to exchange applications. So um, whoever asked that question, um, you do have two different sections of code um, to look at to help you understand that. And um, the, usually the basis of the exchange, it, that there is a legal interest. Most of the exchanges that we see in our office are done based on contracts and the owner of the water right um, would have a contract with someone who files that exchange application. Um, and then those go through our office. I think you might have just done one, I think. <laughs> um, so the next criteria, um, section three, um, the proposed plan is physically and economically feasible. This is another criteria that we have to look at. Um, and it will not prove detrimental to the public welfare. So those are two criteria that, um, or two part of the criteria that we have to look at. I'm also gonna skip to this one really quick. Um, so physically and economically feasible. Um, we, I talked about reason to believe. Um, so that reason to believe standard in an applicant proving it's physically and economically feasible doesn't necessarily mean they have to give us a final design at the application process. Um, only that reason to believe that it's physically feasible. Um, so when you apply for a home, this is a very simple hypothetical, apply for a home, you don't have to submit your home plans um, with that. You don't have to show us that you've hired a contractor. Um, you just, that reason to believe that you have that lot and you're gonna build that home. Um, and economically feasible, um, you're not required to give us a complete financial statement of that project. Just a reason to believe that you have that ability um, to economically afford to do this project. Um, the, let's see, I'm gonna go, so here's actually the next section, the financial ability for the proposed project. So let's say that there are some cases, applications are huge. Um, maybe they um, propose to do a nuclear power plant on the Green River. Um, that may have just a slightly higher standard of that reason to believe. Um, we do have a section of code, um, 73.311, that actually says, um, kind of clarifies a little bit what um, maybe can be provided to help um, show that reason to believe. But it is, like I said, just a reason to believe um, that this application is possible. So the fifth criteria, statutory criteria, um, is that it was filed in good faith and not for purposes of speculation or monopoly. Um, water right applications that get submitted, it is the duty of the state engineer to ensure that all of the resource is being developed and equitably distributed um, and that someone is not coming in and just speculating on this water, that they're gonna tie it up and make some money later on it. So there is um, this fifth criteria that you need to meet. Um, and this is just a court case, recent court case that was done. And in this particular case, the court basically said, indeed, the applicants had no lands, no facilities, customers, or contracts. So we had rejected this application, and then the court agreed um, that they didn't meet that standard, statutory standard. Um, the sixth criteria, um, that was actually recently added to statute and it's that an application complies with a groundwater management plan that's been adopted under this other section of code. There are um, several groundwater management plans around the state. Um, you can find all of those on our website and I believe Jim will show them. He disappeared, but um, wh where you can see this. And so if you're helping somebody with an application, um, going, getting familiar with the policies and the management plans that may apply to the area where you're working will help you and identify this. Um, and we're always, the region offices and the state um, Salt Lake office here is happy to help you understand that um, if you need just a little bit more assistance on it. So one other, um, this section of code of 7338, 
So we talked, those first few slides were on 73381A, and that's the statutory criteria where a state engineer shall approve an application if the application meets that criteria. Um, this is a subsection B, and essentially what this section does is it directs the state engineer um, to investigate and withhold approval or rejections on applications if there is reason to believe the application may interfere or um, unreasonably affect. So um, there may be some applications like Clark had mentioned get stuck um, in our process. Um, we may be trying to overcome some of these statutory standards that we have to see or um, believe that can be overcome or um, the application may be held until we do that full investigation on that application. Um, this is just a slide that shows some of the public recreation, um, natural stream of environment. But with this, the, for this portion of the discussion that I wanted to have with you, um, you can see that the approval criteria for applications um, is directed by statute and that standard of reason to believe. Um, these are the criteria that must be considered. So as applicants and as protestants, become familiar with this standard or the criteria that we look at, because it will definitely help your, applicant, your clients or your cities, if you work for cities, understand what you're gonna need to be able to um, help us understand in order to have a favorable outcome of that application. Or if you're a protestant, um, the standard that you need to look at to help us, compel us to maybe deny that application. Um, and the more involved in the process the applicant and the protestants are, um, it's much easier for us to get through these, uh, the application process for you. So I'm gonna switch gears, part two of four. We'll get through this. Um, so quantity impairment. Um, this was added to the statute in 2005. Um, we've pretty much had this come up in all seven of our regional offices across the state. Um, it's not necessarily just focused in one section. So as I, I mentioned previously in the one slide, section 73335, um, and if you get lost in these references of the code, um, Jim can actually, we'll have Jim show where you can go from our website to actually see these sections of code, so if you need future reference. Um, but that section states that the applicant has the burden of pr providing evidence to support the belief that the application will not cause a specific right to experience quantity impairment. So part of this criteria that we look at um, is, is it gonna create quantity impairment? Um, the section of code that's listed on this slide, that slide, um, defines quantity impairment, that basically quantity impairment means any reduction in the amount of water a person is able to receive in order to satisfy an existing right to the use of water that would result from an action in the change application. Um, and it talks about is, is it a reduction in water diminishing the quantity, um, di diminish or change in the timing of the availability, um, or enlarging the quantity of water depleted by the proposed nature of use. Um, so these are statutory criteria that we look at. Um, quantity impairment, and this is a critical one, quantity impairment does not mean, so it means the first slide, does not mean a decrease in the static level of water in an underground basin or aquifer. If the volume of water necessary to satisfy an existing right other, otherwise remains reasonably available. So you may have a well, um, there's water available, but you maybe need to re-drill your well and go deeper. Um, you may, that's not a quantity impairment. Um, you just may need to, to go deeper for that source and this is in that section of code. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking about reason to believe. <laughs> um, with quantity impairment, um, if it's raised, um, it is the applicant's burden to rebut that quantity, of quantity impairment. 
Um, it's not up to us as the state engineer's office to tell you how you can overcome that. It's the applicant that needs to overcome and rebut that presumption of quantity impairment. Um, and the section, so I'm gonna to read to you that code about middle of the slide, that 73335B says, rebutting the presumption of quantity impairment described in subsection 6C. Right below that is 6C, and it says, for a period of at least seven consecutive years, the right has not been diverted from a proof point of diversion or beneficially used at the, the approved place of use. Um, so if quantity impairment is raised for that reason, um, the applicant has to overcome that. Um, it's their burden to rebut um, that information. Um, this next section, um, section two or II, um, the rebuttable presumption does not apply if it's, if it's covered by these sections. So section 73, 1, 4, um, those are some excusable, excusable um, criteria where an application may be excused from non-use, such as it's an approved following program, um, and the priority, you know, based on the priority of the water right, maybe the water isn't available. So under that section of code, and I would, if you think you fit in there, make sure you go to that section um, and look at that, because it's pretty limited. I think there's about four or five criteria there. Um, it also doesn't apply if there's an approved non-use that qualifies under section of code. Now, if you had a period, say you have an approved non-use, and this seven years was prior to that the filing and the approval of that non-use, quantity impairment may still apply. So you also have to be aware of that section of code um, for non-use applications. Um, the next section deals with in-stream flow rights, and um, the other section that's listed there actually deals with the non-use, um, if it hasn't been used for a period of time um, and is placed back to use without complaint for 15 years, that right may be reestablished. And that refers to that section of code. And I'm not really talking about non-use in this particular presentation. So um, quantity impairment. It just doesn't happen without you knowing. Um, so by this section of code, um, it may not be considered, quantity impairment may not be considered through this application process unless two things happen, or one of two things happens. Um, it's a timely protest is submitted by someone who raises the issue of quantity impairment, or the applicant receives a notice from the state engineer within 90 days of filing that application that there's a quantity impairment issue. With that letter, there will also be a memorandum to the file um, that will place on the file and sent to that applicant that will help explain the information that we're seeing so that um, you're not just blindly trying to overcome that presumption. Um, you'll actually know what we were seeing and what information we have. Um, and the notice, essentially, when it gets sent, it must identify a specific existing right or rights that is believed um, will experience quantity impairment, um, and it needs to be mailed to the owner. So any of the applicants will receive um, notice of that quantity impairment. Um, the next section, and these are just three subsections under that same statute. Um, it's not required that all of the rights be identified. We may just identify one, but there could be others that may be impaired. Um, the owner of the right that's identified that may experience, say the state engineer sends a letter saying this water right may experience quantity impairment because of these reasons, that owner is not a party to the administrative action unless they file a timely protest. So their, their right may have been identified, but they don't become a party which um, is critical in asking for deno or reconsideration or an appeal on the application. Um, the next, the last section, if there's, say, quantity impairment is raised, um, if there's an agreement between the applicant, the protestants, and the persons identified, um, they can 
the, the conditions of that con uh, stipulation or agreement may be incorporated into that change application approval. So this is um, one way of rebutting that presumption is to get an agreement between everyone. Um, so um, like I mentioned, um, it's the burden of the applicant to overcome the presumption of quantity impairment. That's our staff member, our regional engineer out of Logan, and he's not rebutting the presumption. He's just out there. But it is up to the applicant to rebut that presumption. Um, that's actually Will. Um, and if the applicant can't overcome that presumption, the application will be rejected. Um, so that action will get taken. Um, so as I discussed, the state engineer shall reject applications if the applicant is unable to meet the burden of providing the evidence. Um, however, um, if, if otherwise proper, the state engineer may also, on actions on a change application, approve it for part of the water, and we'll talk about some conditions later. Um, if the applicant acquires the conflicting right um, or implements, um, provides and implements a plan approved by the state engineer to mitigate the impairment of an existing right. So there's a couple other parts of statute that can help an applicant there. Um, so moving forward, I'm gonna switch to hearings here just a bit. Um, probably take about 15, 20 minutes. I think lunch is here too. So talk briefly about hearings. Um, as you saw in some previous slides, um, once the application has been advertised, and um, these guys talked about that application process, and the protest period is complete, a hearing may be scheduled um, to gather additional information or evidence on that application. Um, it's done the, in conjunction with the application records. We will come out to the region office and we do it in conjunction with the regional engineer for that area and most likely regional staff. Um, and we gather additional information or hear the protestants, um, you know, if they have additional information that they want to give. And just to kind of reiterate with the hearing process, um, we know a lot of times, and I've even had this in my neighborhood, where you just don't agree with the project that's going in. Um, coming to a hearing and saying you just don't like them um, really doesn't help us understand how um, you not liking them compels us by statutory criteria to not approve that application. So if whether you're representing an applicant or a protestant in one of these proceedings, come with evidence and fact. Um, we definitely, I'm kind hearted. I love to hear stories about folks in rural areas and um, hear their water issues. But for us to make a decision on that application, we really need the evidence and fact. And so as you represent folks or you're representing your own water rights, help us to understand based on the evidence and fact what you're doing or what shouldn't happen. Um, so just with this, uh, the hearing process is actually um, outlined in rule, administrative code rule R655-6. You can refer to that if you'd like later. Um, they may be held if a protestant files a timely protest and requests it, um, but it's also up to the discretion of the regional engineer if maybe they've heard that before and there's no additional information, there may be, may not be a scheduled hearing. Um, it is an infor informal proceeding, so you don't need an attorney to represent you. Um, you can bring one if you'd like, but you do not have to have one. Um, the hearings, they are open to all parties, and it is to in introduce evidence and cross-examine witnesses, um, make arguments, and just allow for the participating parties to, to give their comment um, and their information that they have. Let's see. So um, there also may be non-party participation. Um, a person may choose to have an attorney representing them. Um, that attorney himself is not a participating or 
a party to the application. They're party to the application by the applicant. But that applicant may also have um, maybe an engineer representing them or some other professional that's representing them. Those folks are not, they're non-party participate. Participating as a non-party because they're representing the applicant. The applicant is the party to the application. Um, and um, those such persons, um, since they're not party to the proceeding, they may not seek the judicial review. So keep that um, in mind. Let's see, this was a, just an example of a, a recent case done, the decision last year that basically said, although these parties are aggrieved persons, they lack standing um, and so they don't have standing to contest that decision. So they weren't a party to the application, even though they may have been aggrieved party persons, they didn't have standing. So if you think there's an application that's gonna impair you or quantity impairment, make sure you submit that, a protest to become a party. Um, so the purpose of a hearing, like I mentioned, is to gather information and data relative to the application. And this slide actually is a really good listing of um, the statutory criteria that I've covered through all of those slides um, that you can just see very concisely. Is there an appropriated water? Will it impair? Is it physically and economically feasible? Um, and right on down there. So um, I think the takeaway message from this section of the presentation is that this is the criteria that is used to review those, the statutory criteria that's reviews to use, to re, use to review the applications and make sure that you have good evidence and data to present to us to have that understanding, help us understand that. So another little brief area that I talked about at the beginning of the slide is division policy. So, you know, you have the standard of proof, you have the statutory criteria, but there could also be specific division policy that applies and we have to look at for um, application approval or denial. Um, this is just a photo of the regional offices. This is right off our website, which Jim will take you to. And you can cl click on those various areas to understand the policies like I mentioned. This is another critical piece if you're representing clients in these various areas to understand what those criteria are. For example, um, the Northern Utah County, um, we just adopted a Northern Utah County groundwater management plan. Um, surface waters cannot be transferred to, to groundwater. So that's a criteria that you would need to be aware of um, if you're representing or filing an application in that area. So going to this, um, site-specific policy pages will help you understand your area. And I just threw up this slide. These are some of the various um, site-specific policies across the state, Salt Lake Valley Groundwater Management. There's a Colorado River policy, an endangered species policy, fish policy, Weber Delta. I mean, it goes on and on as far as some specific criteria um, that are gonna come into play with these decisions as well. So I talked at the beginning about approvals with conditions. And um, I just wanna go through some specifics here of conditions. So say you've gone through the application process, you get your OSC, Order of the State Engineer in the mail, and you flip to the back page really quick, you don't read any of the detail or the discussion, and you see approved, and then you don't read anything below it. And you think, well, I'm approved for what I proposed in that application. Well, you need to pay attention because it may say approved with the following conditions. Um, that means it's a conditional approval of the application. And it may not be everything you asked for. And reading that full order will help you understand how we came to that conclusion. Um, and these are can be very critical to the applications because it may not even be able to get a certificate on this application if certain things are not met in developing that project. And we'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. Um, one of the common 
criteria or conditions that will be on an application is it may talk about the diversion depletion or it may give a reduction in the amount applied. And there'll be a paragraph that says condition number one, and this is just a sample from a, a change to Lehigh. Lehigh can't divert under this approval, its condition cannot divert more than 132.94 acres, acre feet, and they can't deplete more than 294. So those are the criteria that um, this application is for. Plus, they must maintain records of that diversion and depletion um, limitation. So if you get an approval, it may have this condition in there. And if you're a city, um, be aware of this because you're going to have to make sure that you comply with it. Um, there may also be a criteria to meter, measure, and report that data, and especially for a city. You may have to meter all of your sources, measure it, um, measure your sources, and then report it most likely to our water use program um, or maintain records that could be available for the state engineer or in cases where there's a river commissioner you may provide that information to the river commissioner to help balance that. A um, couple other conditions, um, well abandonment. As a city, you may have acquired an individual well home, right? Um, you're no longer going to use that well and you're moving it into your municipal system. Your a condition of approval may be that you need to abandon that historic well. It cannot be um, that well cannot be used and must, may, must be abandoned if there's no water right for that. So just be aware, this could be a condition that's on um, the order of the state engineer. Um, another condition that's quite common is if you file a change application based on shares of stock in an irrigation company, you have to maintain those shares of stock. Um, just because you had and filed that change application doesn't mean that you can stop paying those assessments. You still need to maintain those shares of stock with the company. Um, retiring a prior use with a change application um, with an existing water right, you have the right to file a change application, but you've got to give something up to get something else. And there is a, you, generally a condition that you've got to give that up, that historic use up. Um, municipal right considerations, this is an example that you may not be able to get a certificate. Say an individual is proposing to sell that water right to a city and the change application actually lists the city's facilities for this water to be diverted. Well, that individual can't access that city's facilities um, and this condition may come in that that water right needs to be transferred to the city before proof can be filed so that it actually needs to be owned by the city. We can't certificate a water right or won't if this condition is there to an individual inside a public system. So that's just another example of a criteria. Um, there could be a distribution regulation talked about river commissioners. Um, you know, there could be a priority limitation on that water right that this change can be made, but it still needs to be made within the priority of that right. It can't be taking at, take, taken outside or ahead of another water right. So that could be um, a regulation, a distribution regulation that's a condition. Um, and you need to work with the river commissioner if that's the case, and if there's additional um, cost to that, you may need to pay for that um, service of the commissioner. Um, facilities not owned, um, there may be a question or a condition that's put on an, a change application where the application is proposing to divert water and use water um, from a ditch or a well that's on somebody else's property. Um, the approval may be conditioned that it's limited to the right to divert and beneficially use the water, but it does not grant um, any right, rights to access the land or the use of the land. Um, so keeping that in mind, just because you have an approved change doesn't mean you can go, they approved me to use your well. Um, you do need to still work through that with the landowner. So in kind of wrapping up just a little bit here, so, um, 
The Utah Code, the 73381A, said it shall be the duty of the state engineer to, to approve the application if there's reason to believe. Um, and we talked about all that criteria, but there could be conditions. And just be careful in those conditions that you understand what they are. Um, and in 1C, if it doesn't meet the requirements of this section 7338, um, it shall be rejected. So those are really, that black box does have a definition to it. And um, these are the sections of code that um, help us make those decisions. So just the last item, um, Jim, I, um, hopefully he'll cover where they can find code and rule. Um, because I think that will really solidify. I know when I sit in presentations like that and they're jumping all over and quoting statute that it's a lot easier to maybe digest it if you can read through it as a whole section. So he'll cover that. But um, with that, I think you can either go to lunch or I can have Chris answer your questions. Oh, Chris left. No, <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> oh, there he is. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. If you guys want to eat, I'm happy to also talk to you after or, or whatever. Anybody have questions or you're really just dying to eat? I think you're dying to eat, right? Okay, then come find me during lunch if you wanna ask a specific question, I'm happy. So, thank you.